Thank you for listening to Mormon Sex Info. This episode is an archived episode and is only now becoming publicly available. Mormon Sex Info relies on contributions. To contribute, please visit mormonsex.info. And now, please enjoy this episode. Hello and welcome to Mormon Sex Info. This is Natasha Helfer Parker and today I'd like to welcome Shannon Hickman to the show. She's a licensed clinical social worker, got her um, undergraduate degree from University of Utah and then her master's degree at Rutgers University. She's an ASECT certified um, sex therapist and works at a private practice in Murray, Utah. So welcome to the show, Shannon. Thank you, Natasha. I'm excited to be here. Great. Very excited to have you. Today, our topic is going to be about premature ejaculation, just trying to understand what that diagnosis is about and treatment protocols, etc. I know that you uh, work with a lot of LDS clientele, and, and some of what we'll be talking about today is not really LDS specific because this is a, a diagnosis that affects all kinds of people, yeah. but there might be some LDS themes that we touch on along the way as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, but why don't we get started with just basic, a basic understanding of what we're talking about when we're talking about premature ejaculation, what's the definition, what's the diagnostic criteria, et cetera. Sure. So, um, premature ejaculation, it's a sexual dysfunction. Um, and it's also, I think more preferably nowadays, referred to as early or rapid ejaculation. According to the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and uh, Statistic Manual for Mental Disorders, it's a persistent or recurrent pattern of ejaculation occurring during partnered sexual activity within approximately one minute following vaginal penetration and before the individual wishes it. Um, it must have been present for at least six months and must be experienced on almost all or all occasions of sexual activity um, and uh, causes clinically significant distress in the individual. And also, the sexual dysfunction is not better explained by a non-sexual mental disorder or as a consequence of severe relationship distress or other significant stressors. According to the International Society for Sexual Medicine, the definition of premature ejaculation, um, which always or nearly occurs prior to or within about one minute of vaginal pe penetration from the first sexual experiences, or a clinically significant and bothersome reduction in latency time, often to about three minutes or less, um, which would be acquired PE is what they're referring to, and the ability to delay ejaculation on all or nearly all vaginal penetrations and negative personal consequences such as distress, bother, frustration, and or avoidance of sexual intimacy. So I know those are pretty detailed. <laughs> we could break them down. Yeah, for sure. Key thing, if you want me to kind of point out, is um, both of them define as ejaculation occurring um, approximately within one minute following vaginal penetration. So I think that's kind of a key thing to note. Oftentimes, I think people feel like if they ejaculate within three minutes, two minutes, five minutes, they have PE, but that's not the case according to these definitions. Right, and so therein lies usually a pretty common problem because women in general take, you know, anywhere from five to 20 minutes to reach orgasm, climax, and yeah. so there's this disparity with men, I think, and maybe you can correct me on these numbers, but it seems like men, it's more like three to seven minutes. Is that, yeah, that, that right? the average? Yeah, the average time of, um, or length of intercourse is two to eight minutes. Some people say five, some people say two to seven minutes. So um, that's exactly right. But if you don't know that, and, you know, the, the female in the relationship is, continually, you know, needing a longer time for penetration to be happening, then that can be a really frustrating thing to be, to be occurring in their relationship. Right, right. So a huge piece of this, which we can talk about a little later, is just how important this communication is with your partner. 
And sometimes um, a lot of men with PE think their partner wants them to last longer when that's not really what they're asking for or they want from their sexual experience. Okay, great. We'll definitely visit that. Um, let's start with maybe a little bit of male anatomy because we're going to be talking about things more specifically and then we'll break down these definitions and then we'll get into into further things. Sure. So the male reproductive system, um, if you were to pull up a picture, you would be able to see um, there's urinary bladder and there is the penis as well as the urethra, which is um, where the urine comes out of. Um, there's the glands penis, which they refer to a lot with one of the treatment techniques, um, which is pretty much right behind the head of the penis. And then we have the testes, um, or the testicles, and then in, outside of that is kind of the sac that holds the testicles is the scrotum. And um, men have a prostate gland. I should have mentioned earlier, I'm not a physician, so um, I'm probably not explaining this as well as a physician could. The prostate gland is behind the anus, and uh, it can be stimulated through the anus sometimes um, for pleasure. And then there's an ejaculatory duct, which is where the ejaculation comes through. Also just wanted to mention, um, because we're going to talk about it later on, the PC muscle, which is the pubococcygeus muscle. Both men and women have this muscle, and it's um, a hammock-like muscle that stretches from the pubic bone to the coccyx, which is the tailbone. And it is often referred to as the hammock and the sac, I guess you could say, that kind of holds everything up, holds everything together, and it forms the uh, floor of the pelvic cavity, and it supports all of the pelvic organs. Okay, is this the muscle that we're talking about when people are doing Kegel exercises? Yes, right. yes, okay. exactly, the PC muscle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Why don't I just let you go through whatever pieces you want to in the definitions you just gave us, and just slow it down a bit as far as maybe what is it that they're saying, because sometimes, you know, medical language, and, uh, and another thing I'd like to touch on, too, is why would this, which seems to be a pretty physical issue, be in a mental health diagnostic manual? Sure, sure, no problem. So, first of all, uh, I think I touched a little bit on the beginning of both of these definitions, we really talk about um, this being kind of a, a recurrent and persistent pattern, so something that's happening often, and um, it's occurring within approximately one minute following vaginal penetration. Both of these definitions refer to vaginal penetration, which um, for some people may or may not be something that you know they've experienced, but there just isn't enough research out there on PE occurring with um, same sex partners with oral sex or um, with masturbation so we don't know about that right now and there's just not enough evidence for any of these definitions to have that included in it so I just wanted to touch base on that okay and before you go on I also want to make sure that people understand that for men especially the first few times they're having vaginal sex usually it's very typical that ejaculation happens almost immediately. Yes, I'm so glad you touched on that. Yes, definitely. So if you're uh, on your honeymoon so, or <laughs> you do yes. not have PE just because this has happened no, the first no, few no. times you've had sex. It's excitement and it's build up and that would be very normal. Um, this is more something that you're looking at is, is either lifelong or you haven't had a problem with it, and then you've developed a problem, which they um, have termed acquired PE. So lifelong PEs that you've dealt with, they're not your very first few, but after that. And also, I just want to ask this question. Is there any correlation between the amount of foreplay that's occurred until the vaginal penetration? So in other words, if there's been a lot of manual stimulation or oral stimulation, you know, the male's quite aroused, um, and then finishing up with vaginal, can that have any correlation or not necessarily? Right. N um, not according to these definitions, but I would think um, just as, you know, sex therapists, 
that would make a lot of sense if they've spent a lot of time um, stimulating either with manual stimulation or other activities that they would be really aroused and turned on and could ejaculate very quickly. Okay, so um, the kind of second piece was that, um, at least in the DSM, they really wanted to see this as a pattern for at least six months before you kind of call it PE, um, and that it was in most areas, uh, almost all or all um, occasions of sexual activity. And then really the other piece that's so important is that it causes clinically significant distress to the individual. Um, or some of these other definitions say, or to the partner. That one, um, either the individual or the partner, is experiencing frustration um, and uh, distress, bother by um, the early ejaculation. The other piece that they touch on um, is that it can't be better explained by a, another mental disorder, maybe like depression, anxiety, something else is going on that would be causing the PE. And also, um, it could be the effects of a substance or a medication or another medical disorder. So there are some contraindications there. Okay, so in other words, there's a lot of different things that could be taking place in a person's life, such as stress, anxiety, right. depression, that might, um, I guess, show up in a sexual setting where right. sex isn't happening in the same way it has. Or, um, And I think also you mentioned relational distress, right? So, Yeah, um, it could be something going on in a relationship with the husband and wife. Maybe, um, you know, they've been fighting a lot or um, it could be that she wants to have a baby and he doesn't want to have a baby. It, it could be all kinds of things going on in the relationship. Do we know then what might cause premature ejaculation? Like what are the causes for it? So um, it can definitely be um, medication or substance induced. That was one of the things that they talked about. Um, unfortunately, the research is so, it's still, there's so much research that needs to be done that nothing is really set in stone. But um, there have been studies done and they have correlated PE to prostatitis, which we talked about the prostate gland. Um, so it can be an inflammation or infection of the prostate. And uh, also it can be uh, a genetic um, there's a genetic correlation that they've done studies and found that there may be um, some sort of gene that causes this. And I think for years and years, PE has been diagnosed and, and people have been aware of it for 100 years. But for most of that 100 years, people have thought it was psychological. And now what we're really finding is that a lot of this is... Um, is physical and can be explained medically versus psychological. It can be both. Um, one of the other things that it can be if it's been acquired PE is hyperthyroidism. That's a big one. Um, so it's really important for a man, if this isn't something that you've been experiencing for um, a long time and since the beginning of having intercourse, it's really important to go see a urologist and rule out everything medical to make sure um, nothing else is going on. So uh, the prevalence, what they kind of estimate internationally, more than 20 to 30 percent of men ages 18 to 70 report concern um, about how rapidly they ejaculate. So, I mean, that's all ages, kind of spanning everybody. And uh, if we take a look at these two definitions that you and I have been discussing, that really only pertains to 1% to 3% of the population. So this is really how rare this is. It kind of indicates that. Oh, there's a lot more people who think they have if, PE they don't that, that, that wouldn't really qualify under the diagnostic criteria. Exactly. Now, that doesn't mean that they won't benefit from some of the treatments we're going to discuss. If they want to last longer, they can do that. But they wouldn't, you know, be clinically diagnosed as having PE by a therapist or a doctor.
else. Right. No, and that and that maybe can head us into a little bit of the discussion about myths and misconceptions about PE and what are some of the messages that men and women kind of deal with as far as sexual expectations and anatomical expectations, um, just maybe messaging around what it means to be a successful or good lover. I mean, what are some of the things do you think that are pretty common that people are dealing with just psychologically as, as they think through some of these issues? Well, I think media and cultural influences are huge um, for a lot of sexual problems and concerns. And um, for this one, you know, men are supposed to be strong. They're supposed to be able to perform to the best of their abilities in all aspects of life, you know. Um, sports would be a really good example. That's something a lot of men do from a really young age. And, you know, it's kind of, they get these messages that, we have to be the best. We have to perform. This is what our bodies are for. Um, and then also just, um, you know, I know in our culture, just providing for the family. Um, and so I feel like sex is just an extension. It's an extension of these beliefs and what society tells us is the norm. Um, also, movies. This is huge. Movies and TV, sex is portrayed as lasting for hours, or they talk about it as lasting all night and for hours. And um, also that the man's just ready. He's ready as soon as the woman wants it, um, that men can be ready any second to have sex. And that's, that's a myth. That's not true. Going along with that, that's what women see too. So that's what they expect of their partner. Yeah, and an interesting correlation to this is that oftentimes, I mean, there's two sides, I think, from the women's perspective. I, I've seen women where they know they have um, orgasmic potential or sexual potential, but because they feel their partner doesn't last long enough that they can't really ever quite get there. Yes. And they haven't really, you know, to your point, you haven't communicated or negotiated how to kind of bridge that gap. Or you have women who think that they're, anorgasmic or can't have orgasm or even don't know that they're not having orgasm because sex isn't lasting long enough for them to really kind of get to that potential. Right, right. So um, one of my favorite books that I recommend um, for couples and for men is um, She Comes First. Um, it was written by Ian Kerner who he describes his lifelong struggle with PE and so in order to satisfy women he mastered the art of oral sex for women kind of lingus um and i think a common misconception that men and women have is that women have orgasms from intercourse and penetration and that's maybe true for about 30 percent of women but for the other 70 percent of women they need clitoral stimulation to reach orgasm so i think it's really important for men if they are suffering from pe to realize um that they can learn so many other ways of making sex enjoyable and fun for their partner. And that it really comes down to communication. Um, being able to communicate uh, with their partner and express that they may have a concern uh, in the beginning that they even have PE. That's a really you know, difficult thing for someone to talk about, but there may be a concern and the first thing they need to do is address that and then find ways together of um, increasing sexual satisfaction around that. Yeah, that's excellent because, you know, it is concerning to hear the numbers that you mentioned as far as how many people really feel less than or distressed that they're not providing the right type of, I don't know, loverhood. Can I make up words? <laughs> and, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and when really it, it isn't so, you know, I think we're very performance-based society as far as how we've done sexual education. I'm talking about general society. Yes. And so, you know, I think a lot of times people just expect to, that it's just going to happen naturally. I'm going to kind of naturally know what to do. And when that doesn't happen, which is very common, then instead of understanding that that's common, it's very easy to start getting into self-blame or a partner blame, you know, if you're on the other side of things and, and thinking things aren't working the way they should be. Right. And with couples who haven't had 
sex um, ever before and they saved themselves for marriage, they really, and, you know, maybe mom and dad didn't have the talk with them and they had very little sex education. Uh, going into this, usually all they know is from media and from cultural influences. And, and for most of us in the United States, that looks like penis, vagina, penetration. And they aren't really taught to explore their own bodies, each other's bodies. And find out what really is pleasurable because each person is so unique and different in that area. And also, like you said, with the goal of um, orgasm in mind, you know, it's important to realize, okay, that's like going from A to Z. So let's not miss all of the pieces that happen in between, like the foreplay and the kissing and the cuddling and all the other definitions of what sex can be. So you mentioned some of the physiological possibilities, you know, there, there might be some genetic components to this. Um, obviously if you've got some substances going on, whether they're medicine or even things like smoking or tobacco use, or, um, I know alcohol, those all things can affect obviously our sexual organs, just like they affect everything else. But let's move into maybe some of the psychological causes. So what might be happening from a psychological perspective, usually again, subconsciously or more consciously, that could be getting in the way of, of the sexuality that people want to experience? Sure. Well, I think um, with PE, and if they have experienced this even one or two times, they, uh, the man often now has performance anxiety. And so anxiety is a huge piece that can come along with this. And it's difficult to tell whether um, the PE is causing anxiety or the anxiety is causing PE. And often men that have PE have some degree of erectile dysfunction. And usually that's because they're so worried about performing and being able to last long enough for their partner. Um, that can be a part of it, depression you know, could play a part in it. Like we talked earlier, um, we talked about medication and substances, but I think a lot of times in my experience, in my practice, it's um, conflicts within a relationship. And uh, I've had clients that have had um, really dysfunctional relationships with one partner and then um, either worked on that piece and you know, through communication and therapy and um, had a lot more um, success with these treatments and uh, a lot of them didn't even have PE any longer. So it really can be closely tied to relationships. I have one person in mind that um, was in a really toxic relationship and ended up getting a divorce and um, with his next relationship, he had no problems with PE. So that, I mean, it really can have a psychological base. It can be totally based um, in psychological uh, reasons. And with the right partner, I think men can really learn to have confidence and work on this. Um, so the partner is a huge piece of this treatment. Yeah, that's really interesting because I've, I've often heard, um, I think the somewhat tongue-in-cheek kind of diagnosis, you know, of like, Okay, put a Band-Aid around your penis um, at night, and if you wake up and the and the Band-Aid's kind of, rip, you know, kind of came off, you know, like you've become erect during the night, mm -hmm. uh, then you don't have PE, right? right? <laughs> but, um, but I think that's somewhat problematic because PE can be situational. I mean, obviously, nobody's a fan of infidelity, but I've, I've heard, you know, times where it's like, well, I have PE with my wife and there's a lot of anxiety or like you're saying relational distress. Um, so then an affair develops or for whatever other, I mean, affairs are complex issues, but now I'm, I'm not having PE with that partner. So, it, you know, so just because you've had an erection in the morning or just because you've had an erection with a certain person doesn't necessarily mean that it can't be situational. I mean, would you agree with that? Oh, exactly. Yes. And I think for a lot of women that, if they do have a partner experiencing PE, they um, can get really resentful. And a lot of women, one of the other myths is 
um, that the partners have often is that the man's being inconsiderate and doesn't care about them, which is not true. Most of the time, it's completely the opposite, and they're so worried about being able to perform or um, being able to last long enough and please their partner that um, they often um, start to associate sex, you know, really negatively. And uh, they just, they get so caught up in those, the negative self-talk and those emotions that they really start to avoid sex. And it's, it's not anything that their partner's doing necessarily in that circumstance. So it's so important for the partner to be supportive and for the couple to work on this together um, if possible. So we've talked about the definition. We've talked about maybe some of the causes that are taking place as far as having an impact on this. Uh, we've talked about some of the male anatomy. Do you want to move into then, okay, so let's say we've diagnosed it correctly. I think there's one more myth I just want to touch on, if that's okay. In the sure. Talk there. So um, Paul Jonoids um, actually talks about this in his book, Guide to Getting It On, but um, one of the more recent myths that's come about with PE is that um, the use of porn is causing it. And uh, in his book, he discusses that if this were true, there would have been a huge increase in the number of men with PE over the past two decades, but there hasn't been this increase, so um, that's not an accurate correlation. Yeah, case, really. You know, any women are concerned about that or in case that that's a belief in the relationship. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because that has been an interesting point of discussion that's been, I guess, in some journal reviews and things that I've been reading is this correlation. And I think in some extreme cases <laughs> where, you know, maybe that's all a person has been doing for like 10 hours a day, 30 right. days a week, you know, 30 days a month, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. there might be some correlation there as far as being able to perform with a partner, you know, um, on a variety of levels. But that that in of itself is not a, a direct correlation. Exactly. Exactly. I thought that was just an important thing to touch on for people. Yeah, especially when I think there's a lot of discussion around pornography and LDS culture and a lot of fear-based education on it. And it, I think it's, it can be really scary for somebody to find out that a partner's been looking at porn or what does this mean for our marriage or... And of course, just even within the religious implications, you know, a feeling like this is a very much a betrayal of their marriage, et cetera. So it's complicated right. enough without adding that to it. I agree. And if a person believes it is correlated, um, either the spouse or themselves, there can be a lot of shame um, and guilt that goes along with that. So I think it's, yeah, it's important to recognize that that's not the case necessarily. Okay, so are you comfortable moving then on to what what do we do if this is the diagnosis that's been given after, you know, correct assessment, et cetera? Um, before we get to treatments, I just want to touch on one more thing with the couples and the partner. Um, before you start all these treatments, it can be really, really helpful and important. Um, and I recommend one of the first things the couple starts working on is finding ways of helping the partner to reach orgasm. Um, in doing this, then she won't become resentful and not all the focus is on him. And if she's satisfied, it also helps her to be more supportive and helpful um, when it comes to trying techniques. Piggybacking off what you mentioned too, that she's maybe um, been holding back her excitement for years because um, she's trying to help her partner last longer. So by giving her another way to have an orgasm or do other things, then she's free to let go and express herself openly, which is really, really kind of a new thing um, for a couple if they've been experiencing PE throughout the relationship. So not making it so foc one person focused, right? Because then exactly. again, what are we... It's all about him, right? What about me? And even though we're trying to help him, that in in inadvertently creates the anxiety we're trying to get away from, right? Exactly. Right. right. I would say anxiety and sex are like really not BFFs at all, right? Like they're no. really mortal enemies. No. <laughs> so have, have a whole nother podcast yeah. on that for sure. <laughs> okay. Can you give some more specific examples 
about what that might look like and you know let's say a couple comes in to see you and they're like we've got this issue with PE and you assessed it and diagnosed it but you're starting off then saying okay well this is the first step we're going to take what kinds of suggestions or explorations would you be able to come up with with a woman to do exactly what you just mentioned sure so I would first ask her kind of um, and the couple what they're comfortable with what they've tried a little bit of exploration there to see. Um, I don't want everyone to recommend anything that a couple's not comfortable doing. Um, so talk to them about, you know, what sounds nice and um, maybe what she wants, what her needs are, what her desires are, and um, helping the couple to expand their definition of sex um, from it not just being penis, vagina penetration to, okay, maybe it's, um, sensual massage and uh, you know it's cuddling and it's a heavy makeout session and like you said earlier Natasha women need a lot longer time to get aroused um, than a man and to be able to climax so for her that may be spending um, 20 30 minutes um, maybe even longer on really helping to relax her body and clitoral stimulation. So it might be the manual stimulation. It might be with the use of a vibrator if they're comfortable doing that. And then, like I said, that She Comes First is one of the books I recommend for men because I think it gives them an actual step-by-step -step instruction manual kind of, of how to please their partner in different um ways of learning to do that through oral sex yeah so just giving a lot of different options and I love your comment about redefining sexuality I don't think I have a podcast where that doesn't come up because we do want to make options be wide and not just be very rigidly kind of in a box you know where these are the only things we think can can mean successful sex Right. I have couples visualize and, and write on my whiteboard a, a giant umbrella and on the umbrella I write sex and then I have one little tiny piece of that umbrella being intercourse and then we come up with all the other um, definitions that they think could be sex. It's really um, individual and unique to each couple and I think that's really empowering to allow them to do that and to let them know that because what may be sex for um, one couple um, may be different for another couple. So this is kind of a period of where they can really explore and have fun and be creative. I also wanted to just touch base on, I think it's so important that you've talked about the couple. Like this isn't a wife saying, well, okay, this is your problem. Go talk to the therapist and fix it right? <laughs> and then come back. It, it really is a relational issue, just like most actually mental health things are um, yes. it doesn't affect just the one person it affects the system that they're that they're in and so having the the spouse be part of that treatment can just be so uh, beneficial for both of them right and especially because the man is already feeling so much shame so much guilt inadequacy so for the woman to actually let him know that she's there for him and that this is something they can work on together um, creates it decreases anxiety and um, it you know the treatment outcomes are a lot better if the partner is willing to do this and doesn't look at it like well it's his problem he can go fix it on his own so once they've done that when they've maybe they've done a few sessions with you just kind of focusing on that aspect of it then what what as far as actual specific treatments for right PE? right so I think in the very beginning, one of the most important things is to help um, the man learn relaxation techniques and ways of kind of quieting his mind and quieting that self-talk, negative self-talk that we were talking about. Um, and some of that's just statements that he might be saying in his head like, um, I'm not going to be able to last long enough or I have to last long enough. And um, often that's what creates the performance anxiety. So helping to quiet his mind and then that helps him to start to learn um, and have a greater awareness of the mind-body connection. Um, in my experience, and I know I've had other colleagues and, and therapists say this and mentors, that um, 
most men with PE, they typically do everything fast. When I ask them this question, they usually laugh because they do everything fast. They eat fast. They drive fast. Um, Stephanie Bueller even uh, refers, even says her uh, clients a lot of times when they have PE, they show up early to appointments. So we talk a lot about just learning to slow down, relax, be present, be mindful. Um, this can be a really big first step in uh, developing techniques for lasting longer. So I might teach them deep breathing, um, diaphragmatic breathing, um, which is that really like what babies do, the belly rising and falling. Um, deep relaxa uh, muscle relaxation, things like that for them to, to start to be able to do on their own. Um, and also one thing that these men uh, often do is uh, try to distract themselves. Um, so it's really important for, you know, they might be thinking of basketball or grandma <laughs> or something in order to, to not have um, an ejaculation so they won't allow themselves to have sexy thoughts. And it's really important for them to begin to allow themselves to um, have sexual thoughts and to feel and pay attention to the sensations that are happening in their bodies when they're with their partner um, or, you know, when they're alone. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, I know that can happen if you are distracting yourself often um, and trying to think of other things, it can lead to erectile dysfunction as well. And clearly we don't want that on top of the PE. Another example of how the anxiety around this, trying so hard not to have this happen, distracting yourself. I mean, just even as you're talking about it, I can just feel kind of the the frenzy that must be happening for somebody, just worried about it, trying to think of something else. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't let myself get too aroused. Boy, that's that's a lot of energy to, to come to the to the sex space in. Yeah, so much. And their partner can sense it usually they know you know when your partner's not present with you or they're thinking about something else so it's taking away from the sexual experience and from the connection okay so a lot of mindfulness a lot of deep breathing a lot of relaxation yeah, yeah. um and this yeah. maybe is practice they can do prior to sexuality i think meditative practice for all of us helps us um what if, uh, and I'm guessing you're also recommending this during sexuality, so kind of finding a mindful space during sexuality? Yes, yes, definitely. And um, one of the things that's really important to remember when you are, when I start talking about these treatments, that they take commitment. Um, they take commitment for the individual, they take commitment for the partner, and um, it's sometimes going to have to be lifelong. It's not something that necessarily... Um, is going to work overnight. And I think that's really important for somebody to realize because I know when a lot of people come into my office, and I'm sure you get this too, Natasha, um, for sex therapy, they want a quick fix. They want an overnight fix. And um, this isn't something that you can do with PE necessarily. Um, it could be daily. It could be weekly. It could be monthly. Um, and oftentimes, um, you know, when I start talking about some of these behavioral techniques, I let people know it's something that's good to revisit quarterly just to remind yourself kind of how this works and so we don't fall back into the, the old patterns. Um, so that's an important thing to remember before going to that. Okay, um, so uh, the other thing is I like to tell clients that I usually recommend trying the least invasive treatments first because. Um, the medications, a lot of them, most of them have side effects. So um, they, you know, don't come without uh, some concern and risk with them, I should say. So some of the methods and one of the other ones for mindfulness, which we don't have to go into detail, but um, is a sensate focus, which you can do with a partner. And it's really just touching, non-demand pleasure. And so it's just touching for the sake of touching each other. And this is a really good way for the man to learn kind of about what he likes, the sensations in his body. So that can be really helpful. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Natasha, but 
um, they can look it up online or um, if they are seeing a sex therapist or wanting to get help for this, it's something that can be taught during session. Yeah, there's there's some great resources around sensate focus exercises. And the, the main idea is that this is an exercise where really the goal is not to have sex. We're not going to have sex, right. but we're going to really focus on pleasure-centered touch. And this can happen... Um, in all different kinds of ways, you can warm up to it, you can start clothed, you can start, um, you know, by not touching certain areas of the body, you can then move forward to being less clothed or nude and including the entire body. So it really becomes, and, you know, you just kind of take turns. So it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of, and it's, um, in a sense, it's this idea that I'm going to play the role of giver and then I'm going to play the role of receiver, you mm -hmm. know, so that. You can really just enjoy touching your partner, and then you can just really focus on enjoying being touched um, and seeing what that brings up for you. And sometimes it's not all enjoyable because it's a little awkward at first, or, or right. it can feel weird, <laughs> or it's different, weird. Very different <laughs> right. than anything you've ever done before. Yeah, or it triggers different ideas or right. thoughts. You know that then you can talk to your therapist about. Or <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But uh, no, I'm a big fan of Sunset Focus, and yeah, I am too. And we'll definitely maybe link to some resources around that. Okay, perfect, option. perfect. That was great. Um, okay, so one of the first treatments, uh, the first two behavioral treatments I'm going to talk about have been around for years. They're kind of the ones that have been around the longest. Um, the first one is the squeeze method, um, and this would be where, and I just want to kind of point out that. Both of these techniques I'm going to talk about, I refer to with a partner, but um, most therapists encourage uh, individuals to start these methods on their own, um, just to get an idea of um, their own sensations and their own limits and um, their body. So this can be done with or without a partner, both of these. Okay, so the first one's a squeeze method. This is where a man... Um, stops manual stimulation or intercourse when he is close to ejaculating and he or his partner squeezes the glands of the penis which um, is we talked about a little bit in the very beginning um, when we talked about the anatomy but it's um, right uh, behind the head um, and there's kind of that little frenulum that little piece of skin um, and you just squeeze right there until the arousal subsides um, and uh, another squeeze method, um, which we I also talked about earlier, um, is um, squeezing that or clenching that PC muscle until the urge to ejaculate is gone. So um, a lot of people recommend doing Kegel exercises for this. They're not just for women, they're for men too. Um, and so you can look up more on that as well. We can add a link to that. But um, doing Kegel exercises and just strengthening the pelvic floor can be really helpful for men um, in learning to last longer. So that's one method. Uh, the other method is the start-stop method. Um, and this involves uh, stopping intercourse when arousal subsides. So both of them are kind of similar that way. And this can be helpful in teaching a man how to recognize when he's getting close to the point of no return. So over the edge. He's ejaculated. Um, so a man with PE usually has no idea um, when he's close to that point. It sneaks up on him and he's gone from zero to 60 with no warning. So this is a great way for men to kind of learn um, their limit in their own body. So um, it helps a man to be highly aroused without ejaculating. So what I do is... Um, I encourage clients to, um, this is the one I encourage clients to incorporate the technique every few months. And um, what it is, is either a woman, um, the partner, or the man can do this himself, but you begin manual stimulation um, of the penis. And then I usually, not everyone does this, but I usually have a client pick a number between 1 to 10, where 1 is not being aroused at all, 10 is over the edge, ejaculation, point of no return. And um, to pick somewhere maybe for the first time, like the number four, and practicing 
um, getting aroused to a number four and then stopping. And then practicing again, getting aroused to number four and then stopping. Um, and once they've kind of mastered this, then moving to a higher number, which would be closer to 10, closer to the point of ejaculation or the point of no return. Um, so they can do this for a while. This could last for, um, you know, a few days if they get it mastered or a few weeks or a few months. But this um, really helps the man um, maintain arousal um, and learn to maintain arousal with out going over the edge. Um, okay, so I think those are the two most popular behavior techniques. Do you want to touch on any of that, Natasha? Or should I go on? No, I think those, those are really great. And again, I think what's often difficult for couples is that this flies in the face of the myth and conception, misconception, I guess, that, um, that sex is just going to naturally happen. We're going to naturally know what to do. Yeah. And, and here we are, you know, poor little old selves having to do this technique that our sex therapist told us to do. You know? mm -hmm. and, and we are so bad off, you know, compared to other couples. And, and I, I just want to really challenge that, that these are things that you can really incorporate and reframe to be playful and fun. And, Hey, we're going to do our, you know, our little techniques tonight, or we're going to do our little exercise and we can have fun with that versus seeing it as homework. Right. Or this really kind of like a uh, humdrum. <laughs> no, that's such <laughs> a good of point approach. to touch on. Yeah, no, totally. Make this fun. Make this fun with your partner. Um, and uh, in the beginning, um, they, you typically want you to start with um, a dry hand, but then add lube, you know, uh, make that fun. You can do different um, flavored lubes, different kinds of lubes. I mean, yeah, I think that's such a good point, Natasha. This isn't homework, and it's, um, you know, they're not broken is the big thing to remember here, too. Um, anyone can use these techniques to enhance um, their sexual experience. So that's really important, too. If you are the man that's lasting 10 minutes and you or your partner aren't happy with that, you you can um, incorporate these same techniques. So they, they work for everybody. Um, and the other really important thing with these techniques too is to, um, it can be really helpful for your partner um, and for you to recognize some of the physiological signs when he's getting close to ejaculating and um in the guide to getting it on which i keep talking about it's one of my favorite books but um it's by paul jonites he discusses some of the signs are the veins in the penis begin to bulge um the penis gives a sudden throb the head of the penis darkens in color and the testicles um uh, go up into the groin and the muscles begin to tighten. So those are some of just the basic physiological signs that a man goes through when he's getting close to ejaculating. But another reason this is so important for the man to explore is this is different. This can be different for everybody. So it's really important to pay attention to what's happening in your body so the man can recognize when he's getting close to, um, to ejaculating. Okay, so that is the behavioral techniques. Some, of, this is kind of newer, uh, some of the research has shown that a sleeve, like a silicone sleeve or a, a flashlight, and um, they can look it up if they want to know what it is, but it's basically um, kind of uh, similar to the feel of what um, a vagina would feel like. And uh, sometimes this can be helpful for a man to learn to control himself prior to um, any vaginal penetration. He can use one of those to get used to that first. Um, the other thing that a lot of men what use... What was the second that, name? I'm sorry, uh, what, what was the second name? Flashlight. It's F-L-E-S-H. So like flesh, the color flesh, and then light, L-I-G-H-T. So that's a product? Yes, yes. Okay. It's a product that you can buy that um, is sort of a, um, I can't find the right word I'm looking for. I don't want to say fake, but 
um, it, it's uh, similar to um, a vagina, the feel of a vagina. So, so like a fake vagina. <laughs> okay. Um, so simulation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was having a uh, a senior moment there. Okay. Um. So some men try numbing sprays, creams, and condoms. Um. One of the things that um can be really challenging with these numbing sprays is they use benzocaine, um, which is uh a numbing agent so if they are going to have partnered sex um, or intercourse partnered intercourse um, that benzocaine can get on the female and if it gets on her clitoris um, could easily inhibit her pleasure inhibit her from having an orgasm so that's just one thing to be aware of um, but you can use some of those creams and sprays with condoms um, which some people do and the condoms some people say that they help um, to delay ejaculation, but there's really no research um, that's been done on this to prove one way or another. And the last thing um, that's kind of most, I think, therapists, and I, I don't know, probably everybody's different, but I would probably recommend this um, unless it, the client was coming in in crisis and really, um, you know, needed something now. Um, I would recommend those behavioral techniques prior to medication. Um, but sometimes it could work really well in conjunction. So SSRIs are a really common treatment. Um, and the brand names are Paxil, Prozac, Zoloft. Um, and what they found, these weren't originally um, designed for PE, but what they found is that when people took these for anxiety or depression, they um, had delayed ejaculation so then they decided okay well this would work really well for people with PE because it's going to help um, and it'll help them delay ejaculation so those are one of the things um, one of the newer ones that is out um, that they've started to do a lot of studies on is tramadol um, it's a um, I, I, I don't want to say this to be wrong but I believe it's an opioid um, and so the concern with using it is that um, it can be addictive and it is a controlled substance. However, um, typically when they prescribe it for pain, they're prescribing it in doses of like 400 milligrams. And when they prescribe it for PE, it's in doses of like 25 milligrams to 80 milligrams. So that's a big difference. Um, the other thing I want to note that I saw warnings all over about is the one of the other risks with tramadol is the risk of serotonin syndrome, which um, on the um, ISSM, which is the International Society for Sexual Medicine, they um, discuss that that can be a potentially fatal outcome. So these definitely are something to think seriously about and talk with a physician in detail about before you know you decide this is what you want to do. Um, and that's pretty much it for treatments that I uh, can think of. Okay, great. That's a really good overview. Um, and again, to just remind couples, uh, that kind of back to our prior conversation about this not needing to be humdrum, that couples who take the time to prioritize these, this type of treatment, prioritize these types of conversations. Um, usually there is an increase in the intimacy, you know, long range. And so again, not to fall into that misconception of, Oh, we're like you said, we're a couple that needs help or that we're, we have a problem right. versus, you know, there may be couples that never go in for anything like this or have any issues around this, but they're also not necessarily being challenged to think about their sexuality in different ways. They're not being challenged to redefine their sexuality in different ways. And so you can take an issue like this and really reframe it to see it as an opportunity for having discussions and opportunities and experiences and uh, exercises and sexual lifestyle that other couples don't even consider. Right. And I think, Natasha, these men so often um, assume that well, not just men, men and women both do it. These couples, they assume they know what their partner wants and needs. 
<laughs> and it's so important for them to actually be able to communicate about sex, to ask for what they want, and to, to tell the partner so that it isn't a guessing game and we're not assuming. Um, and one of the things that I think um, comes up often is these men assume that their partner, um, and I talked about this a little bit earlier, but that the partner wants them to last longer when often that's not the case. Often there's something else that they would like um, to have greater sexual satisfaction. So I think that's a really important one. And another point that um, Paul Jonah points out is that um, when they did studies and research on this, um, the women reported that some of the most annoying aspects of PE were the constant apologies and self-criticism that the men had of them um, that they were doing. So I think it's important um, to stop apologizing, kind of let it be what it is and recognize that it's a process. Tell yourself it's a process that you're going through to improve sex and, and that it's okay. It's okay exactly where you're at in the moment. Okay, great. Uh, just to go back to a few other possible, um, I guess, ideas for, for lasting longer, it, which may or may not be backed up. These are just kind of things I've heard. <laughs> so yeah. um, is there some truth to maybe possibly having a different position? So, you know, vaginal penile intercourse can happen in lots of different positions. I've heard like maybe lying on your back, having the woman on top can be a little bit less... Um, you know, there's not as much thrusting maybe for the man and, and maybe that can help with some of this. Is there some truth to right. that possibly? Um, well, so I'm glad you touched on that because I forgot to add that um, when I was talking about it. So that is kind of the next step in that stop start method that we talked about. So kind of start um, with manual stimulation and then once they've mastered that, the woman actually gets on top and you do the same thing with her um with her vagina so uh you know it might be um up and down up and down and then the man says okay stop and then she waits and then when the arousal goes away starting again so I, in that sense i know that positions can be really helpful um with the woman on top but i haven't seen any actual um research or data on that but I would say that try it if there's positions that work by I'd say be really creative and try different positions to see if there's one that um, is easier because a lot of times there's one that it, that does cause more friction than another one and the other thing can be slower more um, shallower thrusts that can be really helpful too I forgot to mention that okay and along with that, what are your thoughts about, you know, we talk about um, refraction period, refractory periods, right? So between the time that, that a person ejaculates and then until the next time that they're kind of feeling, let's say, biologically aroused, right? So mm -hmm. these are kind of like your libido ranges, <laughs> right? Um, oftentimes, obviously, can differ widely for couples, so if you have somebody who has, is the higher libido partner, let's say he's the male, and, you know, he would have rather had sex three or four days ago, but he's now going to have sex with his partner now. Um, it seems to me like some of that can also be part of this. And so I guess my, I'm getting around to my question, no, which is, uh, um, is saying. masturbation helpful? So in other words, I masturbate before we're going to have couple sex. So now my refractor, you know, my, I, my initial quick arousal is over and now it's going to take longer for my body to get aroused again. And is that a helpful approach to some of this? Yes, that's such a good point that I um, didn't mention. So the refractory period is the time kind of in between um, when a man ejaculates and how long it takes to be able to get an erection and ejaculate again. So for every man, this is different. And typically the older men get, the longer the refractory period gets. But um, if you have, a, if you know your refractory period, you can definitely incorporate this in easily. Um, or it's important to maybe learn your refractory period. And most men can last longer the second time. So I think that would be a really important thing to incorporate. And also 
there have been case studies that I've read where um, there has been a partner who um, had infrequent sex with their spouse and it, they went so long that it was similar to what we talked about in the beginning, Natasha, when you haven't ever had sex, so that excitement that, um, so it's not necessarily PE, it's that they need more frequent intercourse or more frequent sex, not just intercourse, sex. Um, so that's something to, to remember, um, too. And yeah, I think if, um, a man, uh, masturbates and then he's going to be able to last longer the next time, most likely. And then they can kind of plan, plan for that, that date. Right. So if you know that you're having, you know, you're, you've planned your sex night for that evening, yep. he could, you know, masturbate in the shower that morning. You know, this is something you've talked about and, you know, you're kind of on the same page upon. I mean, I think that in going back to LDS issues is that oftentimes um, because the way we've set up Mormonism with the religious values attached to it is that sexuality has to be a couple thing right. and therefore I can't really be sexual outside of my relationship with you and so then that really sets up some issues when you've got libido differences which can be really hard for either partner right because yes. nobody wants to be the low libido partner who feels like um you know they're kind of controlling the frequency or mm -hmm. having to be the person who's rejecting or afraid to you know there's just so many issues there and then you, yeah. you don't really want to be the high libido partner either because you're being rejected you're being rejected <laughs> you're frustrated there's not a lot exactly. of other options um and that gets tricky when you know you sign up for monogamy <laughs> which is what we do in, exactly. in mormonism and mm -hmm. and we take monogamy really seriously and so that can just be some negotiation stuff that needs to happen as far as um, maybe it's not so much what behavior we actually do, whether it's individual or couple oriented, but that we're talking about it as a couple, that we're coming to these, um, you know, negotiations and strategies as a couple. And so therefore, if somebody's masturbating on their own, it's not like it's solo practice. It's something we've negotiated as a couple to help us have a better, have us have better couple health. Right. Sexual. Exactly. Exactly. No, I think that's perfect. And really just communicating about it together and deciding together so one person's not feeling left out or like they, you know, are feeling betrayed or that they weren't part of the decision making. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Seeing as how you work with a lot of Mormon couples in general, would you say that there are any particular themes or issues that come up? Again, we start off this podcast by saying this is obviously not a Mormon issue, but are there themes or myths or conceptions that that tend to be common within a Mormon population when it comes to to PE? I think one of the biggest things is that um, it's going to be so easy, right? Everyone has this misconception that um, even though we didn't have any sex education, even though mom and dad never talked about it, even though, you know, um, we haven't done any exploration of ourselves or anything with anybody else. We're now supposed to um, get married, go on our honeymoon, and have the most perfect, amazing sex. Um, and that's not the reality for most couples. And so I think they go through um, this sort of period of just feeling kind of disheartened and broken and there's a lot of shame. Um, so I think one of the things that I really try to do um, with my couples and with everyone in general, but especially with my LDS couples, is just normalizing. Really normalizing that um, how could they possibly be having amazing sex when they don't know anything? So a lot of it's self a lot of it's education that we do, um, being really kind and gentle to one another, and um, I would just encourage people if they are struggling with this to talk about it with one another and um, find ways of dealing with it as soon as possible because it can um, really cause a lot of damage in the relationship. Um, 
if you're not working on it and not talking about it and there's resentments building. That's what I find probably most often is happening. Um, and then that the partner kind of feel, and I wouldn't say this is just solely with LDS couples, but that the partner kind of feels like, well, it's not me, it's you. You're the one broken, so you go fix it. Um, and they talk to other couples or they talk to family and hear other stories. And then oftentimes I think that causes even more shame, um, more embarrassment, more guilt, instead of um, understanding and recognizing that um, everyone's sexual experiences are different. Everyone's um, erotic template, which is kind of what shaped you and your sexuality, is different. So it doesn't have to look like anyone else's. I think those are probably my um, number one messages to kind of get across. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I think that's all really great. I, I do think a lot of it is about managing realistic expectations and education and being willing to reframe things and um, being less, you know, less judgmental of self and, and partner. So I think all of those are really great kind of underlying principles to this. Right. And I think Natasha too, one thing that I forgot is um, also that I think sometimes when this stuff is going on, um, that is the only way they think of as having sex. So the woman really kind of puts aside her own needs and her pleasure for the sake of benefiting the man and with whatever concern or problems going on. Um, and so I think it's really important for um, LDS couples to realize that um, there is a lot of knowledge out there um, and that this is pleasure-centered, a lot of it. It's, it is pleasure-centered and it's really important for the woman to feel like she has a place in that sexual experience just as much as the man. I, I hope I said that right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's wonderful. Yeah, I think, um, and again, I mean, you know, even as I'm thinking back to some of the techniques that you mentioned, and, and you know, the spectrum is wide, of course, in, in any population, including the Mormon population, but... Um, just again, if your expectations were that sexuality was really going to be missionary style position, you know, penile vaginal sex, which I think is is pretty common to have that expectation. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then all of a sudden, you know, to be a, a wife that's being asked to, you know, do be part of the squeeze technique, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and uh, when she may not even know how to be comfortable with her husband's genitalia, for example, um, those are really interesting things to, to consider and think about. And, you know, and I really appreciated that you said um, at the beginning that you would never ask a couple to, you know, do something they're uncomfortable with. Right. And yet there's always this kind of relationship that we have with discomfort where usually trying something new or figuring something out that we don't, you know, we've never done before is going to come with some level of discomfort, yes. right? And so there's yeah. this weird interplay with even that concept of I don't want to do anything I'm uncomfortable with, but maybe some discomfort is healthy too, right? So Yes, totally. It totally is. And I usually encourage couples to try everything that unless it's like an absolutely not, to try everything a couple of times before they're like, Nope, that's on my never list. So this would kind of be one of those places where you could just try it, pay attention to what thoughts are coming up. Because a lot of times this is things we were taught that are influencing our beliefs is not necessarily, you know, how we're really feeling about it, but it's things that we've been taught from a very young age that maybe it's bad or sturdy or gross or wrong. Um, so that puts on, it blocks us. Uh, it puts on the brakes and we're not able to get past that. So really kind of um, paying attention to what is this I'm feeling? Why am I feeling this way? because mom told me that I really kind of like it and, and paying attention to that kind of stuff and working through it. 
Yeah, that's great. Well, I know we're right over the hour mark, which is what I said we'd do. That's <laughs> wonderful. And, um, <laughs> but I want to just kind of open up, you know, some space for you to either give us any finishing thoughts that maybe I didn't specifically ask you about or, or just close us up with some of your, of your thoughts about, um, yeah, just your finishing thoughts about this. Sure, sure. No, um, I think, uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. It was awesome. And um, I really enjoy working um, with couples around these kinds of issues and working with men. And I think one of the most important things that I want um, couples to remember, and especially men, is um, that this is okay. And it can be worked on and worked with. And it doesn't mean the end of the world. It doesn't mean you're broken. Um, and, you know, most men can learn to, um, to extend their hang time and learn to last longer. So just to really, I just want to provide hope. I really want to provide hope that um, this is something that doesn't have to um, destroy your sexuality and your experiences and your relationship that um, this is something that can be easily worked on and that couples can get past. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big believer that we should not let any, any one thing define us or an entire experience. And that's absolutely mm -hmm. true for this as well. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time and expertise, Shannon. It's really valuable. And, and I'm just so glad that you were able to be with us today. Oh, thank you, Natasha. You're welcome. It's been great. We took the long road home Turned minutes into miles As the evening traveled on, the sunset bathed your smile. We stopped beneath the desert stars, wrapped in each other's arms. Was as simple as I love you. An ordinary, extraordinary truth. It's been a long road here, a trail. If sometimes we fell apart, we always came back home. Was as simple as I love you, an ordinary, extraordinary. Until 
we're gone Watch it by my side Till the day I die And into the beyond It's as simple as our love is That's how I wanna go It's nothing hard to marry love Ordinary, Ordinary. No, it's extraordinary